proud to introduce Mr. Rajiv Malhotra, who is a very important American Indian public intellectual, and he's going to give a very important and intellectually stimulating talk today on where is India in the eagle's eye, American national interests and their implications on India. What I hope will be an interesting talk. Certainly, I hope to uh, provoke you. Uh, I don't uh, <coughs> expect that anyone will agree with everything I say or with uh, even much of what I say, but the idea is to provoke a way of thinking and to raise some questions which I feel have not been adequately raised. The talk is about India in the eagle's eye. The eagle in this case is uh, America. That's the symbol of America. The eagle, as you know, is a marvelous creature, magnificent creature, very powerful creature. It, it flies high, soars to greater heights than any, anyone, else, anyone else can go. So if you get a ride on the eagle, you can go higher than you might be able to go on your own. The eagle can also choose to drop you, then you can fall pretty low down. The eagle also has claws, so it can grab you. The eagle also has a beak and it can eat you. So it's a, it's a fantastic multifaceted creature and I'm going to uh, give my perspective on, on uh, America's deep culture and how it affects American national interests and then international interests, and in particular, how it affects India. We, we already have some positive perceptions of America. From a business point of view, there's an IT and other industries success story. Indian scientists and doctors in America are doing very well. There are successful entrepreneurs and professionals that we're all very proud of. America's gift to India's youth is top quality universities, which nurture our bright students and offer them globalized future opportunities. America's love affair with Indian culture, there's a lot of uh, Indian-inspired spirituality in America. There's yoga, Ayurveda, music, cuisine, dance, film, and many other things. India is also America's uh, best friend uh, after September 11, or one of them. There are common goals to fight terrorism, countering China's expansion. The last two are uh, problematic as far as I'm concerned, and much of my talk focuses on them, and that is the the, the thought that America is studying South Asia and India as a sort of a gift or as a favor to these countries. Uh, and also another favor and gift is to improve our human rights. However, there's a deeper truth. Is America's approach to India truly value neutral? What would be a deeper and more complex understanding of America? How does America's establishment imagine India and why? What are the consequences for India of this? And what's the role of Indian intellectuals? These are some of the things I want to talk about in this two-part, two-lecture two series. <coughs> a very important concept, which I, I was surprised that a lot of Indians have not paid attention to or not even come across, is this term called manifest destiny. If you go to uh, Google and do a search on manifest destiny, or you look in the Encyclopedia Britannica, or any decent work on even a high school text on American history, you'll find uh, a, mar a manifest destiny as a sort of uh, a doctrine of a chosen people, a special nation, a nation with a special place in this world, a special role in this world, a grand history, uh, <coughs> biblical origins, a special people, and so on. And this manifest destiny has uh, shaped American culture, or a large part of it, and also influenced its, uh, its geopolitics. Uh, these two, the, the American culture and uh, geopolitics, in turn, uh, influence, uh, influence, uh, I think the thing fell off. influence uh, the study of India. I'm going to describe American <coughs> civilization and society in three layers. The most obvious and commonly understood notion of America, those notions lie in what I'm calling pop culture, which is very eclectic, it's hybridized, it's new age, it's very India friendly and so forth, it's postmodern. But pop culture is, is a very deceptive face. Beneath it, where the real power of America lies, what makes America strong, what makes it what it is, distinct and unique, and sustain itself from generation to generation, 
is not this fleeting pop culture, but institutions of power. And these institutions of power are government, business, church, academe, media, and so on. <coughs> this is a very modern rather than postmodern kind of institutional setup, run primarily on the business corporate model. Even the government, even the church, even the academe, even the media primarily are run on a corporate model. And then beneath even this, while, while institutions may tend to be very value neutral, or at least some of them, business tends to be very value neutral as compared to the others. Uh, if you consider profit and so on to be sort of value neutral, universal kind of things. <clears throat> but then beneath these institutions of power is a deep culture, which is a very white Judeo-Christian kind of deep, deep culture. And this, this aspect of America is, I think, rarely understood, rarely studied by by uh, Indian <coughs> Academy and Indian thinkers. Very little, very little have come across by way of uh, work on this from Indian scholars. But in the United States, there's a, there's a whole lot being done on America's deep culture, which is, which is its own self-criticism and self-analysis. There's, in fact, a, an academic discipline called whiteness studies, uh, similar to black studies or Hispanic studies or so on, which, which attempts to get into the deep, deep uh, culture of America itself. And this is, uh, it's a shame that Indians haven't really taken up uh, the reverse anthropology or reversing the case with social sciences to get a deeper understanding of America <coughs> itself. <coughs> so I'm going, to uh, I'm going to give you a summary of what I have uh, found in this. Uh, the America, America's deep culture is a unified whole, even though on the surface there are many divides. Americanism is founded on a very strong sense of patriotism. The flag is almost like a sacred, like a devata. You know, some of the flag ceremonies are like very sacred rituals. <coughs> the, the national anthem, Americans are very, very proud of the national anthem. The, a sense of history, a sense of grand narrative and grandeur about the country. And this in turn is built on several foundations. The goals are preservation of economic privileges for American people, a set of values and lifestyle which, which are very American in nature. Core competence, uh, external competitiveness, and internal teamwork. This is very typically American. One of the first <coughs> things that struck me raising kids in an American suburban area is the importance given to two-year-old boys to learn team sports, aggressive team sports, baseball or something like that. And you, you, uh, we wondered why. Why is it so important that everybody has to be in some team and then these, the, the parents are very aggressive about watching how the team is performing and it's almost like it's something serious is at stake. And what was explained to me is that if you are not, uh, if you're not raised to have uh, have uh, teamwork, aggressiveness, competitiveness, uh, a sense of self-worth, these are the things that team sports invite in, in, in American society, then you are not going to do well. So that's quite a different thing from the way uh, Indians raise their kids, which which does not include this sort of very aggressive sense of. Uh, Team sports. Team sports as a vehicle for training uh, competitiveness, in other words. This struck me as a very uh, different uh, culture for raising kids than, than we have in India. The enabling structures are institutions of power. These institutions uh, bring about a accumulation of uh, structure and continuity from one generation to the next, while pop culture really doesn't. The foundations of the deep culture are white Judeo Christian. Now, on, on this foundation, you have liberalism, you have conservatism. Liberalism is the view that white, the Western Enlightenment has a claim to speak for all humanity, and that's called reason, started in the last four, three, four hundred years. Western ethics is a universal human rights. The liberal, liberals might fight conservatives, but they keep their own deep culture invisible. So there is a deep culture there. Colorblindness strategy is a way to preserve the racial status quo. I mean, it's analogous to, to upper caste Indians saying, look, uh, I have no caste uh, pre preferences, I don't care, so there is no problem. It's a way to sort of dismiss the problem by saying it's not my problem or I'm, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm caste blind, so I don't, I don't even uh, care about it. Uh, what that does is it perpetuates the status quo, which is in the favor of some people over others. So the doctrine of color blindness has been criticized as a really a ploy or a way to preserve the status quo. The conservatives, on the other hand, are more blatant and direct and honest about being a certain way. 
So the, 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 the biblical social ethos very explicitly is anti-abortion, it's, it's for creation rather than Darwin's evolution, it's anti-gay, it's evangelical. And these, these are not secrets, you don't have to go snooping around doing much research to find this out. You just ask them and they'll be more than happy to tell you this. The Bible Belt includes lower socioeconomics. A lot of people feel that uh, conservativeness, uh, conservatism must be some elitist, big business, rich corporate people, while the poor labor, blue collar type must be, must be into uh, the left wing. Well, that is not the case because the backbone of the, of the Bible Belt, uh, uh, so to speak, uh, is in fact a large amount of uh, lower socioeconomic socio strata. The conservative identity also provides safety during adverse times. This is also interesting when, when unemployment is high, when there's adversity, then people go back to roots of who we are as a people. And the sense of nation, the sense of identity plays an important role as a safety net. Now, Gallup, George, Gallup is the preeminent uh, uh, polling organization. And George Gallup wrote an important book on uh, American religions. And he does, they, they poll about American religions uh, every year. Uh, but I picked a year prior to September 11, 2001 on purpose because a lot of people might think that the trends to becoming highly Christian might be the result of September 11. This, these are statistics from Gallup prior to that event. Uh, for instance, 89% want their kids to get formal religious education, which means uh, Judaic Christianity. 39% classify themselves as born-again evangelical Christians, defined as one, the Bible is a literal word of God, two, have experienced a personal conversion to Jesus, and three, speak, seek, to, seek, to, seek to lead non-Christians to conversion. More teens and adults go to church today. This is quite an opposite trend from Europe, where, where going to church is going out of style. Here it's, going, it's becoming even more so. 75% like the Bible to be included in literature, history, and social studies. So I think we may think of America as a sort of secular country, and some institutions, yes, the institutions are secular, but beneath the institutions is a deep culture which is biblical. The American Textbook Council has a position on a history textbook which says, world history assumes great importance in an age when regions and civilizations compete for power and resources. If students grow up ignorant of the nation's Anglo-European roots and the evolution of modern liberal democracy, as citizens, they will fail to appreciate their political fortune. If students learn to consider their nation unworthy or malign it, or if they embrace globalist fantasies and illusions, the ability of, of citizens to construct robust foreign policy will be hindered or checked. In this respect, the curriculum becomes a national security issue. In the case for relative stress on Western history is that America's democratic ideas and practices are rooted in the Judeo-Christian, Greco-Roman, and Anglo-European past. The study of Western thought, ethics, and politics is essential to understanding liberty, the separation of church and state, representative government, the rule of law, individuality, and human rights. This is similar to, I mean, if something of this sort uh, happened in NCRT books, where, uh, where uh, it was the Indian equivalent of this, uh, it would be considered uh, saffron and nationalization and stuff like that. But this is, this is uh, what you see if you were to go and do a review of school textbooks, and I've, I've been doing that for 10 years. There is also political support. This is a, a testimony on, in the, before the United States Senate. It says, determining what history children will learn, who will be heroes and villains, what themes will dominate and what messages will be sent are crucial subtexts in civic education. At worst, biased instructional materials are undermining students' appreciation for America and citizenship. In other words, the idea that we have a certain thing called we are good, proud Americans, we have a great nation, must be imbibed through our education system with a grand narrative, history and stuff like that. So that's very important. Now, the history of America's manifest destiny, if you study this, this one chart is worth, there's volumes written on this already. It went through many historical stages. The early pilgrims uh, called themselves English, uh, because they happened to be English. Uh, they, then many non-English <laughs> Europeans came, so they started referring to themselves as Christian. And that's relative to and in contrast with the Native Americans, just to have a term for themselves, which would make them different from the Native Americans. Then, when the Native Americans were also converted to Christianity, uh, then they started calling themselves white. 
So in the 1600s, the term white became a very official term, filling literature, filling media, and some laws were enacted about white people. Uh, then, then the Irish, Irish were not considered white until the 1850s. There's a book called How the Irish Became White. Uh, it's, it's a Harvard, you, you can look up, it's Harvard University Press, How the Irish Became White. It's very interesting because the, uh, the, since the British, since the English ruled over Ireland, uh, in America, the English were entitled to white privileges, but the Irish were not. And, and so the white unions, which gave work only to white people, would disallow and keep the Irish out. There was a lot of violence. And, and, and as a result of some violent acts in uh, Philadelphia when hundreds of people died, some new rules were enacted and, and a treaty was made that Irish would be admitted into white unions. And that's the, what the book shows how the Irish became white. And then Jews were, Jews were not classified as white people until the 20th century. Uh, there's a book by, uh, by Karen Brodkin, a UCLA anthropologist, called How the Jews Became White Folks. And that gives you the history of uh, Jews entering into whiteness. So while it was Protestant, then when the Irish became white, it the ethos became Christian because they were Catholics, and then when the Jews became uh, white, it became Judeo-Christian as sort of the national ethos. And then during the time of Barry Goldwater all the way to the Pat Robertson era, there's been this Christian coalition, and American values are Christian values. There's also a movement called Christian Zionism, which, uh, which has to be understood in order to get an assessment of deep American culture. During Reaganism, this evolved into fighting evil abroad, which was the Soviet uh, empire. <laughs> and even during Carter and Clinton's liberal eras, uh, the government supported exporting Christian evangelism. In fact, what pe people are not aware of quite often is that while Clinton and Carter were liberal in many senses of the word, economic sense of the word, as far as uh, exporting Christian evangelism is concerned, that agenda continued to accelerate during their regimes. Now this sort of thing gets support from the private uh, side. Uh, there, for, uh, as one example, uh, I've studied the Pew Trust, which is a four billion dollar endowment. Uh, it's a non-profit organization and its mission statement says, the commitment of J. Howard Pew and others in the Pew family is to support institutions that uphold historical, historic Christian principles rooted in biblical standards. It goes on to promote recognition of the interdependence of Christianity and freedom. They do research to show that. The dependency of Christianity and freedom, aggressive strategies for engaging the larger secular academy, institutional linkages with universities to foster sustained interaction between Christian and secular scholars, prominent centers, they want to create prominent centers that can serve as drivers, sustainers, and organizing centers to provide an institutional context in which Christian scholarly networks could interact regularly with other mainstream scholarly networks across a variety of disciplines in the humanities. Now, most of us think of uh, time Newsweek, U.S. News and World Report is very secular media, and they indeed are. But what does secularism mean? I have a collection of about 15 or so uh, uh, special issues in the last several years from these mag three magazines, where the cover story is history of the Bible, historical Jesus. The, the, it's something where the, the Judeo-Christian religion is treated with great respect as literal history. Something about biblical archaeology could be a special issue and things like things of that sort. And it's very interesting. I also collected the international edition, the Asian edition of the same issues, and it's always a different story. So if the story in North America is uh, the latest scientific dis discoveries about uh, the historical Jesus, then the corresponding Asian edition might have something like Italian bistros, something like that. So, so there is a certain export uh, variety which is very different from what's consumed uh, locally. I'm now going to talk about the institutions of power just a little bit. The corporatized structure rules government, churches, and business. So if you, if you have experience in American corporate life, and that is where my discovery of American culture started, is studying how corporations work, how power works, how decisions are made, how the hierarchy is maintained, how, the, how, you know, how to interpret behavior in a, in a corporate setting, how to interpret the behavior of your boss, your colleagues, how power plays occur, your subordinates, and all of that. And, and upon studying that, I started finding that similar structures permeate uh, America, American life in other ways. So, this, so having been inside American institutions is, it gives you a different view than if you haven't been there. 
I guess a good analog would be if somebody has been in the IAS, then as an IAS officer, if you work from the junior levels all the way to a top level, uh, you'd be able to say you understand how the Indian administrative machinery works in ways that an average uh, citizen, or uh, no matter how smart or intelligent they might be, they wouldn't even know. So having been, having been an insider to the, av to the American corporate structure from very low level to, higher le to top levels, uh, I had this experience which allowed me to understand institutions even beyond business and recognize that they ran on the business model. I mean, you go to a church meeting as a volunteer, I mean, they have market share, business plan, budget, they have MBAs, they have corporate attorneys, uh, you go to, I'm a, I'm a, a advisor, I'm on the board of the Red Cross, they run in the corporate model, very professional, very, very professional. So professionalism uh, in, the, in the American institutions is a very corporatized uh, sort of uh, training. Power-driven corporate ethos, competitive, professional, systematically aggressive, with clear boundaries, and unapologetic grand narratives. And I'm particularly talking to Indian intellectuals who have really been uh, swept by postmodernism, who believe that, uh, uh, that competitiveness, boundaries, grand narratives, identities have gone out of style. I don't think they've gone out of style. In fact, they are getting more intensive. The, ac their ac the academic blind spots have caused some scholars who, who, haven't had any exper who haven't had experience inside institutions. And, and, and therefore, there are these beliefs that text can be interpreted in a very variety of ways. But try to interpret a corporate instrument, a deconstructed corporate instrument, uh, as, as some kind of postmodernist, chalta hai, anything goes, it kind of. Try telling a corporate attorney who has written a very uh, detailed uh, contract that, you know, it could mean that, it doesn't matter, it might mean that. The other party may be me, I may be the other party. I mean, this sort of stuff that is very popular and faddish in postmodernism just doesn't cut it in, in the strata of American society where power resides. Hybridity, blurred boundaries, etc., these are just nice fads in postmodernism. You find them in advertising and PR, you do, but not in the institutional core. American institutions are the antithesis of the postmodern ideal. Then, uh, pop culture. Now, pop, study of pop culture is sort of uh, uh, faddish. Uh, I call it the scholar's opium. So we can study that, you know, uh, uh, Britney Spears got a bindi, and Madonna's got a new belly button, and so it's Times of India, page three kind of stuff, and think that that's an understanding of America. It's become very trendy to sort of look at Hollywood, Bollywood, Broadway, fashions, and characterize American society in that manner. It's trendy, transient, superficial tier, reflective of entertainment, advertising, and corporate PR only. Disconnected from the other layers, it's neither a barometer, barometer nor agent of change. For example, of a false class. Ask a black person if the portrayal of blacks in the entertainment industry, sports, movies, music, is really an accurate barometer of blacks in society. And they will tell you, hell no. So, uh, entertainment industry ownership, management, and clientele is upper class elitist, even though the product may be very postmodern. But the way the corporation is run, even in the entertainment industry, is nothing postmodern about it. A, a, a person may have a very competitive day job in a cutthroat industry, say on Wall Street, and then he can go home, have a very casual barbecue or, or, or picnic or something. And if you catch him in their New Jersey home after they've had a very intense week in Manhattan, uh, you will see a very postmodernized family life, of course. But that's not where power comes from. That's not where the, the core culture is. Brutal institutional rat race sustains a family lifestyle of elitist kids with punk hair, body piercing, and windy. So if you hang around my neighborhood and see what the, these rich people are around, uh, and you go to their homes in the evenings, and you see their kids on skateboards and with the purple hair and all that, you think that it's all become very postmodernized. This, this, the America is kind of, you know, there's, it, there are no boundaries, it's all postmodernized. But even that lifestyle is sustained because dad goes to the office and mom goes to the office and they have a very cutthroat, intense life. And they are chasing every single percent of market share from competitors, they're into uh, corporate takeovers and, 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 and uh, aggressive management of the bottom line. And that is what keeps America going. And then, 
If you are successful in that, then you, as a luxury, you get to go home and put on a very postmodern uh, life on the weekends. The rich pay $75 to watch a postmodern Broadway show, for example. So there's three layers I've talked about, and they have their, their approaches to India are also different. Pop layer is Indian traditions have made their way through New Age into American pop culture. For example, 20, there's a $25 billion yoga industry, which is one and a half times India's IT exports, by the way. <laughs> That's pop culture, so Indian, Indians do quite well there. But, I mean, Indian culture does quite well. Indians have less than 1% of this share of, uh, of uh, 200,000 yoga teachers, $25 billion, and 27 to 28 million yoga practitioners. The business layer, which is driven by the, the attitude towards India is, I think, very positive. Uh, it's driven by institutional mechanisms. It's very pragmatic. It's uh, how to win-win, how to make money, how to work with you, and things of that sort. And I'm a product of that, so I understand that, and I feel that Indian, India and Indians have a very good opportunity uh, in, that, in that aspect with, with, the, with Americans. Then there's a deep culture, uh, which is the manifest destiny driven, not always explicit. In the case of the conservatives, it is explicit. In the case of the liberals, it is implicit. <laughs> the point I was making is that it is, not, it is not absent because someone is a liberal. They just aren't. It's just very deep, deeply rooted there and not very obvious. America is larger than life for Americans. Hundreds of historical societies across America for pride of heritage. I mean, the analogous situation would be if there were a, a Jalandhar historical society and a Pune historical society, and, and they were enormously successful and filled with lots of activities to document and to, to respect their history and so on and so forth. But Americans are really into the study of their history. History books showing greatness of Western civilization are among the top nonfiction categories. Hugely popular are presidential libraries, historical monuments, theme parks, parades, emblems, and badges of identity. The U.S. flag is proudly displayed at cemeteries, car dealers, bumper stickers, gas stations, so on. Americans sing the national anthem on more occasions and with more passion than any other than other democratic nations. I mean, it's very, very uh, important to uh, respect your, your flag, respect your national anthem, be very, very proud of it. I don't see that in India. I think there's a, I'm drawing a contrast. I'm t explaining the deep American culture where I think it's different from the corresponding deep Indian culture. College departments in classics, history, philosophy emphasize mainly Western civilization. I don't see the equivalent in India of emphasizing Indian civilization. All levels of politics are based on patriotism. I mean, even the far left Ralph Nader will say, I'm a good American, I'm a proud American, America first. I mean, that is very important. Now, some of this is set up to, the, to make the following points. The postmodernist view is we could say that today at the end of the 20th century, as history gives way to the postmodern, we are witnessing the dissolution of the West. This is what some people have said. My position is USA is following a trajectory that is drastically opposite, different from Young's analysis. Not only USA, I mean China is not dissolving, uh, France, England, uh, Russia, I mean they're all into more nationalism than ever before. It is widely accepted that Eurocentrism no longer seems acceptable in a world where others are reasserting their own notions of past and future. My, my counter position is, but acceptable by whom? by a group of college professors who have promulgated these theories and their gullible students. I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a cocoon effect in liberal colleges where they have talked each other and their students into believing that the world has changed and the world has become a certain idealized manner, but it is not really the way the world is. Scholars falsely assume that a new standard of acceptability has spread outside the academy. So the postmodernist Popularity is to deconstruct nation states. The nation states are going out of style and they're no good. Deconstruction of dominant identities. All culture is text for deconstruction using trendy theories. My counterposition is that the American grand narrative is deeply embedded in its institution of power and in the white culture. Academics wishfully think, think of the disappearance of West, Western grand narratives or geographically bounded nation states. Are academics too invested in their theories? I mean, I just don't see evidence of postmodernism in the five 
permanent members of the UN Security Council, for example. I think there's just no evidence that they are dissolving themselves. I see no evidence in the Fortune 50 or Fortune 100 saying, hey, you know, it doesn't matter whether you use my brand or my competitor's brand because it's the same thing. It doesn't matter if my market share goes up or down. There's no such thing as the other. There's no competitor. It's all the same. I mean, I just don't see that. If a postmodernist started talking inside the corporate office, they would be fired. I mean, this is the, they wouldn't want such a guy around. I mean, I just I don't see this uh, this trendiness in Indian intellectualism uh, being uh, being truly reflective of uh, American society. Is postmodernism for export? Is it is it an export product? Deconstruction ideology failed in American mainstream. It had little impact on American nationalism. It's thriving in liberal academic cocoons and pop culture. By denying the unity of anything, including lived experience, postmodernism is the credo to fragment the third world in an intellectually deep and respectable fashion. Postmodernism softens the targets. Third world intellectuals are a franchise to reproduce for local consumption. Many genuinely believe they are serving the downtrodden. Wall Street Journal a year ago had a front page major story on evangelicals give U.S. foreign policy an activist stage. Some quotes. Evangelicals are embracing international causes, are making a mark on U.S. foreign policy. The evangelicals' growing involvement in foreign affairs creates a new constituency for intervention abroad. No, at no less than 43% of the U.S. population calls themselves evangelicals who support foreign intervention. More born-again Christians work in this administration than in any other in U.S. modern history. This activism harks back to another world power that struggled to balance ambitions for gold and God, the British Empire. U.S. evangelicals are driven by the same tough-minded Christianity that propelled Britain's empire. The genius of the evangelical movement today in domestic and foreign affairs is its grassroots appeal. And they're rallying American evangelicals to the plight of persecuted Christians abroad. There are all these databases that are keeping track of Christian persecution by country, by district, and huge rallies, huge rabble-rousing to mobilize fundraising to, to go to their rescue and to call on America to intervene. Persecution abroad has become a hot topic on Christian radio and television. The Evangelical Coalition's legislative agenda led Clinton to sign the International Religious Freedoms Act in 1998. If overseas religious conflicts arise, a U.S. president could face pressure to come to the aid of Christians. It's only a matter of time until foreign persecution and religious conflict become hot-button issues in the U.S. In, in the elections, in the U.S. elections. Foreign intervention via human rights. So some of this, some of this is happening through NGOs in the name of human rights. Secretary of State Colin Powell quoted, just as surely as our diplomats and military, American NGOs are out there serving and sacrificing on the front lines of freedom. NGOs are such a force multiplier for us, such an important part of our combat team. NGOs, according to the U.S. aid administrator, NGOs are an arm of the U.S. government. And of course, here's a quote that in the Northeast, the Indian Home Ministry has blacklisted 800 NGOs for alleged links to uh, insurgents. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, go away from the internal society and deep culture of America and talk about what are the external pressures. America has two problems. It, has, uh, it sees itself uh, being uh, closed in from both sides, from China on one side and, uh, and Islam on the other side. It, it, this is America's view. And you see it all over the press, all over the thinking and so on. Uh, the, the clash with China is a clash of modernities. Uh, the industrial economy of scale of China, the industrial economy of scale and efficiency of China like, uh, competes with that of America. Uh, it's competing as a military and political power. Uh, it, its ethos is materialism and consumerism. Now, it, the, I use this analogy of father and son. Uh, I, I consider Chinese modernity to be, uh, well, something happened here. Okay, oh, good, we're back. Uh, I consider this as a father-son clash in which... Uh, uh, American modernity is the father of Chinese modernity. So China the son is fighting America the father, saying, you know, I can be more modern than you, bigger industry, more efficiency, more profits, more military, that will feed more military. So it's the son having learned from the father, because the father created uh, China's modernity. Now China the son says, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to supersede my father. So it's a son versus father uh, clash of modernities. 
On the right hand side, there's a clash of fundamentalisms. Because you have historical prophets with finality, you have God's franchise to man, you have exclusive claim over all humanity, in conflict. Two alternative views of the same kind in conflict with one another. This too is a father-son clash because Islam is an offspring of today Christianity in line with the same in line with the same prophets. So what you have is America has created two sons, a, a, a fundamentalism son and a modernity son. And both sons are up in arms against their dad. So it's two sons versus the father. And it's not an easy thing for America. It's not an easy predicament because there is no easy solution that America has for either one of those battles. And neither of those two sons will go away. And each of them has, uh, each of them knows how to fight the father because the product of the father has been an offspring of the father. So that's a, that's a perspective I have. Now this takes me to India. I've given a sort of a background in America, but what does it mean for India? The China threat and the uh, Islam threat have it challenged America, challenged from both sides. But from within, it has this grand narrative of manifest destiny, uh, a, a great nation that should remain great, will remain great, and so on. So people have been promised, kids have, kids have been raised uh, with certain textbooks and certain education uh, to expect something as Americans when they grow up. But the reality in the outside world is, a, is threatening, <coughs> threatening that American dream. So there's anxieties, and this, uh, this, uh, it, it, this is the mindset uh, with which America approaches India. So there is a view that says, let's build up India. And there's a view that says, let's fragment India. The build up India says, uh, it will be counter to China's hegemony, in containment of Islamic threat, immediate Western corporate interests, stabilizing influence and role model in the third world. Of course, problem is that if India is very successful, it will be a competitor to Western economy long term, so we'll end up creating another China. If we, if we build up India, short term and medium term, it's very good for all these reasons. But in the long run, it will be a, another billion person strong competitor that will you know, come after us in economic terms. So there's another belief that says fragment India, divide and ro rule discourse, very common in social studies of, of about India, South Asian studies, Dalits versus Brahmins, Dravidians versus so-called Aryans, women versus men, minorities versus Hindus, fragment, 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 conflict, conflict, conflict. Uh, benefits to the West, avoids a China-like competitor, a billion contained laborers, so you can, you can harvest uh, labor, but they will never be very strong at, at par with you. Uh, accelerate, it, accelerate the evangelism and a good market for weapons because you can sell the Gujarat army tanks to fight the Maharashtra army or you could sell uh, Andhra Air Force missiles to fight some other one. So a fragmented, uh, broken up would be good for the weapons industry. Problem is it would lead to chaos. If, uh, if it became fragmented far too much, uh, it may Talibanize or it may fall in uh, the hands of uh, the other side in the clash of civilizations. So America wouldn't want India to fall apart either. And it wouldn't want India to become like another China-like strong nation either. So I call this the mother-in-law syndrome. <laughs> the the mother-in-law doesn't want the couple to become too strong and empowered and successful and, and together because she feels threatened that you know she's not needed. So she wants to meddle. And she wants to meddle in different ways, some above board, some not so above board, tell some one person about the other, and always have some dirty secret about each one to keep them honest. And uh, you know, all sorts of things, are, all sorts of games to keep her empowered. On, on the other hand, if the couple is falling apart, if there's too much fragmentation and there's going to be chaos, uh, there's going to be no stable, unified home, uh, she's threatened by that also. So she's threatened by either of the two extremes. And so with one hand, she is stabilizing them, making them strong and encouraging them and keeping them together. And with the other hand, she's also undermining them to make sure she, there is business for her to stay, to stay <laughs> there. So this is sort of the, uh, the American dilemma and conflict in dealing with India like a mother-in-law. So since we're all good at understanding the mother-in-law, we're all very qualified to understand America. <laughs> 
Now, to give you an example, that this is not just theory, it can be very serious stuff. There is something called the Afro Dalit Project. You go online and you do a search on Afro Dalit Project, you'll get some hits. This project has a thesis which says the Dalits are the blacks of India, non-Dalits are the whites of India, and history of American slavery is the framework to understand Dalits' current problems. Institutional support comes from Western churches, South Asian academic studies, human rights groups. Acad activities include build, building an Indian franchise network to promote this, India-based seminars and training of Dalit activists, and then there is something called the Dalitistan Project. I didn't know about this until uh, a woman who is an African-American scholar at Princeton University uh, who was helping me with understanding American culture, deep culture and all that, uh, she said, she asked, she introduced me to another uh, African colleague of hers who's the, who does black studies and uh, in that uh, dinner discussion this other gentleman said, you know, he's just come back from India. So I said, well, what were you doing there? He said, oh, I'm part of this uh, Dalit empowerment project and uh, our role is to uh, have this African Dalit Brotherhood that, you know, we, our experience as blacks in America is, is the framing in which we can help them understand their experience in India. So there's a, there's a tutoring uh, uh, project funded quite uh, systematically that I accidentally ran across. And then I also found that there are, there are these maps on uh, fr fragmenting India that you see in some of these uh, places. Uh, which talk about a Dalitistan, there is a Dravidian Stan, there is a Shudra Stan, there is this Mughalistan, and stuff like that. Now, some of this may seem like a joke, but remember that Pakistan, the first uh, time ever the word Pakistan was mentioned was a, a, a kind of a resolution in Cambridge in the 1920s, 1930s by a few uh, students there uh, who actually ca came up with this acronym and it was taken as a joke and not uh, treated very seriously. Also, a uh, large part of the uh, intellectual incubation of the Naxalite movement happened in, in MIT uh, back in the 60s. So these are, these are things that uh, on a long-term basis have some effect. Now, I have, a, uh, I, I have a provocation about the, what's happening to minorities. Uh, they are minorities in a local context but in a global context, they may have, in some cases, not most and not all certainly, but in many cases, they may have been uh, like a corporate takeover of a, of a local company. Many of them have been appropriated by global, global forces. So what I see here is more nationalism in the Western world. Uh, this is, I'm just talking about America because I've studied it more closely, but there's more nationalism in France, in China, in Russia, in Japan, in Arab countries, and so on. But there is a trend of deconstruction of India as a nation state. Tomorrow's lecture, I'll go very deep into what that is, what is happening in some major academic institutions in America with respect to that. I'll give you examples. I'll, t I'll tell you a lot more about that. However, sub-nations, which are all those different uh, Dalitistan and the, the Kashmir separatism and Northeast separatism and all those, uh, they, are being, uh, they are being encouraged. So identity is considered a good thing when it's for a fragment. It's considered a bad thing when it's for India on the whole. So my question is, could the third world minorities end up as unwitting agents for imperialism and as the new global coolies? Is, and there is no isolated or local context. So today, when you, def when you say so-and-so is a minority, uh, you have to ask in a global context, uh, are they part of a power structure which is globally not a minority? You know, it's like the analogy I would give you is if there is a McDonald's restaurant uh, with uh, 20 employees uh, run by minorities they've hired, uh, you, may, you, may, you will quickly say it's not really a minority establishment because look, if you look at them in isolation, it's a minority. But if you look at where the money comes from, who they report to, what global structure they are part of, it's a, it's a local agent or a local branch obviously of a mighty multinational. The same can also be said of uh, non-business entities, of NGOs, of religious groups, of uh, various other kinds of uh, identities that are now part of and being managed by global configurations. So the question is, can there be a, a deconstruction that leads to another kind of a balkanization? So, question I ask here is, are Indians managed by Americans? 
uh, the businesses are investing in India, subsidiaries, joint ventures, supplier, customer, but this is very above board. This is very above board. And the Indians are very good at getting back as equals. They're doing very well. They will do very well. I, I consider the left column to be very promising for Indians. It may start with the arrow going down, but I think the arrow is, is also be going, beginning to go up. And so it's kind of becoming equal, and Indians may end up having an upper hand with some advantages. I'm not so sure with the rest of it. I see a, a very tight uh, involvement between government and academy, government and churches, churches and academy, and, and all, a funding mechanism that all of them put together. And then these funding mechanisms work their way into India. They, they fund academic, journalists, funding agencies. And the churches have subsidiaries. Churches are like multinationals. They have their subsidiaries. And then there are these NGOs that work in various mysterious ways. So a study of this area, this area which is a complex uh, f infusion of, of funds and influence and ideologies from the upper side of the diagram to the lower side from America to India, I think is something that hasn't been done. In fact, I'm surprised that I couldn't find a single report on this, this kind of, an, uh, this kind of a, uh, mechanism. There's huge amounts of monies that have come, but a report which analyzes who, why, what have they done, what is it all about, what are the implications, I just couldn't find anybody in India who's done this. Yeah, I'll, I'll give that tomorrow. Yeah, I'll give those things tomorrow. General observations, Indian government is missing in action. I don't see them being a factor. Certainly the US government is involved, but Indian government is sort of more at the receiving end. Uh, there's enormous interactions among the American parties. Um, no, I listed all those American parties. They are tightly involved. They have a flow of experts going back and forth. Uh, they have group meetings. They sponsor things together. They're known to each other. They're friends. Many Indians are led by Western influences in this vacuum of uh, Indian grand narrative hurts because when you, the moment you counter, they say, which Indian? What Indian do you talk about? Do you talk about one kind of Indian? But I can tell you five other kinds. You represent this na grand narrative, but this grand narrative, the other guys oppose. So they're very good at coming back <coughs> to make sure there's nothing defensible about India because they'll say, which India? Uh, an equivalent mapping of China would be dramatically different. You just don't have that kind of a diagram in the case of China because China just won't let that happen. China is more in control of China studies, China's own NGOs, China's own, uh, uh, own uh, underbelly, and, and it's closed, uh, for better or worse, it's closed to outside influence. Now, uh, America's complex interests in India, uh, I've broken down business interests, church interests, government interests, academic interests. And uh, then uh, what interests about three issues, sovereignty of India, Indian civilization, and Hinduism. Now, the last column is controversial when you talk to Indians. It's not controversial when you talk to Americans because in their way of studying India, uh, it's a very important aspect of studying India. So whether, whatever you may think of your relationship with Hinduism, you may think you have none, you don't care, it's private, we are secular, it doesn't matter. The American, when he sees you and says you are, or you, finds out that you're an Indian, in his mind, his images of India and, what, and, and Hinduism are all mixed up. They're all mixed up unless the person is a very major scholar and knows a lot. The average American, serious American, in terms of policy making, a serious intellectual, a businessman, uh, is, 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 cannot leave Hinduism out uh, when he's trying to understand you as an Indian. So it is important, therefore, to see what their postures are. Now, the, the sovereignty of India, business, see, if you look across, businesses want stability of India, except maybe the weapons industry. I mean, they could sell more weapons if it were not stable. But certainly Microsoft and Coca-Cola and IBM, they would, they, or Citibank, they want a stable market. They want stable supply lines. They don't want fragmentation because it's bad business. And they're very practical. The green, by the way, in this chart is positive. The gray is uh, negative, And this uh, murky brown background is sort of mixed up, uh, partly positive, partly negative. So the business also, in terms of their attitude towards Indian civilization, you see positive uh, in the way they advertise and they respect Indian civilization. Also, it's good for their labor relations. They don't want to, uh, they know they're hiring a lot of Indian people, both in India and in the United States. The attitude towards Hinduism is to be politically correct and distant and uh, to, be, uh, to reflect labor relations. So I think businesses overall are not 
trying to subvert any of this. Because they're looking to just make money. I mean, they're very straightforward about it. Church, there's a PR. PR says India's sovereignty, yeah, we're very positive, it's a good thing. But in practice, Billy Graham's autobiography says that one of the, one of the things he's very sad about is that he's been unable to have a separatist, uh, to have, a, to have a Nagaland separate as one example. I mean, that's written in there. So that's the practice no matter what the PR says. The attitude towards Indian civilization is that, yes, we like the secularism, but in practice also there is identity engineering. Identity engineering which makes people have doubts about uh, Indian identity and Indian history and in the ability of Indian, Indian civilization to uh, deliver the goods. The attitude towards Hinduism is that Hinduism is same as Hindutva, which is uh, measured based on current politics. So whether you like it or not, whether you as a Hindu are believing in Hindutva or you don't believe in Hindutva or you're even anti-Hindutva, doesn't matter. They will shape you as though you are, you, you, you are part of whatever is going on in current politics. And the practice is to study caste, dowry, sati, gender, that sort of, as a characterization of what Hinduism is all about. Government, PR, we are positive and allies. That's the PR. Practice, I think long-term options are open. I don't think there's anything very long-term in strategic alliances from the U.S. It's a, it's a short-term horizon. Human rights, uh, Indian civilization, the, 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 it, it says, well, we're interested in human rights. It's a very positive thing. We want your human rights. We're here to help you. Uh, in practice, there's a, for, there's a desire to Americanize uh, the culture as much as possible. The, pos the position towards Hinduism is it's a politically correct distance. So I don't think it officially wants to take a stand uh, on, on Hinduism. Uh, but in practice, the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom in Washington, D.C. has regular hearings where uh, very, very often it is a charge against Hindu groups doing something wrong, uh, Christians are victims, somebody else is a victim, but hardly ever the other way around. It seems like <coughs> Hindus are uh, kind of monopolizing uh, bad behavior if you looked at uh, that, the, the hearings of those commissions. The academic humanities Public relations about India uh, is couched in terms like self-determination. That's a very positive way to uh, say fragmentation. But in practice, it really means fragmentation. Uh, Indian civilization, uh, the academics have a very romantic and exotic view. Uh, but in the actual work, if you really come, if you look at what it amounts to, it's often delegitimizing <laughs> Indian civilization. And the view on Hinduism, both, the, uh, both openly and uh, in practice, it says Hinduism equals Hindutva equals fascism. It may not be said in so many words, although some scholars have said it in so many words. More typically, two of the three will be equated. So either a given scholar will say Hinduism is Hindutva, and then he'll stop at that. And his colleague, three doors, three offices down the hall, will say Hindutva is fascism, and he'll stop at that. But equating all three very openly is, is not often done, although that's what students will infer. Now, to summarize lecture one, uh, perceptions and my counterposition. A lot of people falsely think that American culture can be equated with European culture. There's a very different status of Judaic Christianity. Not only is Christianity on the decline in Europe, and Europe is far more secular than America, but this thing, this hybrid thing known as Judeo-Christianity is distinctly American. You do not have Judeo-Christianity as a hyphenated thing in Europe. America is secular in the same sense as India. It's a common perception. Conservatives are explicitly biblical. They're very proud of that. They very openly tell you that. Liberal Americanism includes implicitly biblical structures, which is a very interesting and a very long discussion on how even American secularism has underpinnings like the law is derived from biblical concepts, for example, art history, so things like that. Respect for Bible is mandatory for political success. You cannot be anti-Christian and expect to get elected. You can be pro-anti this policy, that policy, but you cannot openly go out and, and on, a, on a platform of that kind and expect to be successful. Affirmative action is not at the expense of the majority of religion. This is very important. We have something called uh, quotas, reservation, and the, the American equivalent is called affirmative action. 
but it is not at the expense of majority religion. America is becoming postmodern. This is a common theme that you hear. In fact, robust institutions are ant antithetical to postmodern ideals. America loves India is what we hear. America hates India. We hear that. I don't think either of those is true. Uh, Americans are driven by pragmatic and complex self-interests. American individuals are fair and open. In fact, I haven't come across fair and open people from any other country to the same extent as Americans. I think I've come across more Americans who are really logical, open-minded, fair, if you have the ability to convince them, to talk to them in a systematic manner. So the problem has been more uh, lack of Indian engagement, uh, Indian engagement with Americans. Indian intellectuals and opinion leaders. It is said, it is said that Indian intellectuals and opinion leaders understand America. I, and I don't mean to uh, insult or, or uh, undermine or downplay the, um, the strength of scholarship of many people here. But I think that there are some naive concepts about America. Uh, intellectuals have internalized and become consumers of American theories, including its self-criticisms. So there is in the other direction. We can learn from Japan, China, Israel, Korea, and Tibet. They do have long-term long -term programs. USA has a cohesive strategy or a conspiracy to dismember India. A lot of Indians think that. I, I don't think that's true. I think there are disparate voices. There's many different voices in America on, on India and with many different opinions. But independent processes, both Indian and American, could have a combined effect. I mean, you, you don't need to have a conspiracy, you don't need to have a headquarters to undermine uh, India. It can just be the result of unmanaged, sporadic, disparate forces that happen to have a combined effect. For example, uh, there, was no cons there was no plan uh, uh, American plan to have Taliban hold, uh, show up and uh, host uh, Al-Qaeda and bomb America. It, it, it was a combination of random forces. I mean, America's plan was to basically undermine the Soviets using the Mujahideen. And when that was over, America just left and didn't even bother to, to manage anything. And then Pakistan decided to host these uh, the children of the, of the Mujahideen and turn them into Taliban for its own purposes. And then some Saudis decided that we could ho we, they could be hosted and started the Al Qaeda there, and and so on. So it was a combination of many forces with no uh, no sort of conspiracy as such to bring this about, but it happened anyway. So some unintended things can happen to undermine India, even though there may not be an overt plan to bring that about. And finally, there's if India's integrity is invincible. Uh, I feel that centrifugal forces threaten its underbelly. So there's both uh, things that are making India positive and strong happening rapidly, and there's things that are uh, weakening India that are also going on. And finally, to conclude, uh, I'll tell you what my lecture will be tomorrow. Uh, I, 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 having built a foundation on American society, civilization, etc., to the best I could in a short period of time, because it's a very complicated subject, I'll now talk about how India is being studied by, by America. How, India, how and why USA systematically studies Indian society, the funding and institutional mechanisms, popular conclusions, what are the main conclusions, what are the consequences and implications for India and USA, uh, disconnects between, for instance, there are disconnects between US official policy and its social sciences disintegration of India. US official policy is to have a great India or a strong India and so on, but to see what the academics are producing and what they are teaching, it's often not that. The uh, role of Indian intellectuals in USA and in India is also quite, quite interesting. There are 2,000, uh, 2000 uh, approximately 2,000 persons in the United States whose profession is to study India. And if you look at uh, the, the number of uh, faculty people, research scholars in South Asian studies, uh, religious studies specifically about Indian religions, uh, anthropology specifically about India, international religions specifically about India, uh, it's about 2,000. I'm not talking about people who have a casual interest. I'm not talking about the two million NRIs who all read about India on a general basis. I'm not talking about uh, uh, the general public who have a, an interest in India, but specifically about those whose profession is to is to study India uh, seriously and systematically. So if you have if you have an industry which I call the India Studies industry, which employs two thousand people, 
That's a very, very significant industry. It's surprising that there has never been a report done by Indians on this industry. I mean, any industry has a report. So the first thing I wanted to get hold of five, six years ago when I got interested in this is to read all the industry reports because as a former management consultant, I'm used to industry analysis and you go looking for other people's industry analyses and then you do your own. Uh, and I'll show you tomorrow my methodology, how I've analyzed the India studies in America as an industry and what my conclusions are and so on. Uh, but I found that there is no such report, which was quite surprising, surprising to me. Now, besides the 2,000 based in the United States, uh, each of them may have uh, quite a lot of resources, libraries, funding, travel. Each of them may have their tentacles in India. Some of them may have five native informants in India who keep them informed. Some of them may have some friends in the academy who they nurture, and once in a while, they, as a reward, every 10 years, they fly and get them a visa to go to America. Some of them may have a friend in the IAS who, whose son can go to Harvard. They can arrange some financial aid or a fellowship or something like that or go to some Ivy League. So the 2,000 are sort of at the apex, uh, but uh, they are also, it's multiplied. There's a force multiplier with a large number of Indians in India also helping out. So the combined effort is rather large. And, and tomorrow I'll ask these questions, you know, why are they doing it, who's doing it, who funds them, what do they produce, what are the implications, what is biased, what is not biased, and so on. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to take some questions. Maybe we can have some lights, please. Uh, my question is that it's not that the persecution of Dalits is not happening in India. Then why is it so difficult for us to accept wherever it is coming from that somebody is giving a voice to the voiceless? Uh, can we? Uh, I, I'm anticipating this. Uh, I, I have it uh, tomorrow. Can we have the? I can just show you right here. Human rights. Human rights policing by USA. Assuming India, Indian society to be a patient, and I fully accept we have many diseases, and the discrimination against the elites is one of them. I fully accept that. So, but I have seven points, seven points to bring. Are Western institutions qualified to cure Indian society? You don't go to a doctor who's just a quack. You go to a doctor finding out, have you cured anybody? Do you have a cure? So are the Western college professors qualified to cure this disease? What is the past track record of Western powers intervening in third world domestic issues? Have you done that? I would like someone to do that report, show it to me. What is the track record? What accountability do they have as doctors? Doctors have accountability. They have something at risk. If the patient dies, there are some consequences. What, are their, what is their accountability if they come, mess around, and then the whole thing falls apart and they go home? What is their accountability? That's an important question. Does the West have a superior human rights record itself? Have you looked at that? Have you looked at a comparison uh, between <coughs> affirmative action success in America and uh, uh, reservations in India over the last 50 years to see where they were 50 years ago, where they are today, where we were 50 years ago, where we are today? What is the percentage uh, in uh, participation of our minorities and their minorities? Have you done that? If you haven't done that, then you need to do that. Then are human rights definitions and case selections biased? Who decides what's a human right, by what criteria is the human right, and which ones to take off and which ones to simply ignore. Like, we are very concerned about human rights of uh, people in Iraq, but not about people in Tibet. Why? How do we decide that? Who decides that? I'm just giving an example. Are Western agendas constructing cat categories of cultural crimes? So sometimes a certain culture is deemed to be uh, a criminal, or the whole culture is denigrated rather than saying it's just one individual who did it. I will go into this tomorrow in great detail. Uh, so if there is a crime uh, that happens, in one instance it is just considered individuals who did it. Uh, a similar crime that happens somewhere else, it is labeled and branded as that religion, people of that religion or people of that race did it. Who gets to decide when it's a cultural crime and when it is not? Finally, do Indian globe-trotting activists have personal vested interests? These are questions I will go through systematically tomorrow in, because that's an important question and I'm glad you asked it. <coughs> I'm Minakshi and I'm from Delhi University. This is not a question, this is just a comment. You talked about the grand narrative in American history and how they're trying to, uh, you know, imbibe children about that grand narrative. 
in Delhi University, the history syllabus has been revised two years ago. And all the points about fragmentation that you talked about are uh, there in the syllabus. There is, you know, this emphasis on Dalits, atrocities on Dalits, on women. So we are very, very far from that grand narrative. I mean, we've taken a step backward. So it's an anti-narrative. Absolutely. Anti-grand narrative. Yes. Yes, please. So you mentioned, you know, that uh, these uh, Christian uh, Christian rights, you know, right fundamentalists, you know, they are, have such a high percentage, and they are for interventions, <coughs> intervention abroad, giving the percentage and all that. Quite right. I was just wondering, you know, assuming that the Iraq project fails. In fact, I mean, it has already failed. Yes. The train has crashed. Yes. But nobody wants to recognize it yes. because the emperor has no clothes, but the little boy is not there. But that's not the point. <laughs> <laughs> Suppose two years later, you know, when the Iraq syndrome really sort of, you know, gets consolidated, <laughs> do you think the same enthusiasm for foreign intervention will remain? Uh, I think that foreign intervention is a sort of a pendulum each time it bombs out, there is a, a backlash against those who did it. But I think that you have to look at the other pressures, both the pressure from within, uh, which says we are very special chosen people. That's what you know is taught in the school textbooks. I serve on a committee on Asian studies where the purpose is to see uh, American textbooks and particularly from an Asian point of view, critique them. And it's a very long uphill battle to make these changes because the, the pressure from uh, parents and all the committee members to preserve Americanism is very deep. So you have a society which is raising even one generation after another on a sort of sense of patriotism and a sense of privilege and a sense of, uh, you know, we are the great and all that. But if, as the reality dawns that with China, you know, taking away manufacturing jobs, India taking away to some extent some service jobs and many other factors going on and then oil going out of style and $60 a barrel oil, I mean oil going out of uh, supply and all that. Uh, the, as the pressures build, I think the one thing the Americans have which is unparalleled is military strength. Unparalleled. There is no military in the next 10, 20 years likely to come and compete. So, you know, when you have a, when you have a huge unmet need in people's uh, aspirations and uh, you run out of options, uh, you're going to have popular uh, demagogue type uh, presidential candidates and other type of candidates who will say, hey, listen, we have to get going and there will always be some scapegoat or other. I mean, there's a, you know, civilizations that have a high self-esteem, when they have to downsize, have a, a tendency to find a scapegoat. This is not tendency. It's very difficult to say, you know, we got it wrong, our, our manifest destiny, bad idea. You cannot send that to people. You won't be elected. So uh, I, I don't think that uh, the, a failure in Iraq uh, will mean the end of interventions. Uh, it may mean a gap. Yes, please. I have two questions. Number one, uh, when you are expressing concern about the NGOs uh, in the Northeast and, you know, the uh, effort to uh, catch minorities in India and convert them, uh, should we be really taking it very seriously or, and, you know, be too sensitive about it? Because in the process, after all, we have to realize that there is a huge amount of poverty. And will we be throwing the baby out with the bath water if we uh, totally oppose this kind of intervention? So let me answer that first, because otherwise I'll forget it, you know. Uh, I already gave some reasons why intervention for human rights needs to be looked at more carefully before we allow it. Uh, a nation, if you look at the quantity of money coming in, uh, and, and you look at the India's rapid advancement in foreign exchange reserves, and we are investing in all sorts of other things, why couldn't India create in our own version, our own equivalents, our own competitors to things like the Ford Foundation. Why couldn't we, why couldn't Indian industrialists do that? Why, why, do, why do we have to depend on someone else to fund us for these kinds of projects? Why aren't we able to do it ourselves? And why are we not able to look after our own uh, reforms and our own uh, rural projects and uh, job creation projects and some like there is some rural employment project which I think is a great idea. Why aren't we able to why do we have to outsource 
citizen rights and human rights to the West, like we used to do to the British in the 19th century. It was very fashionable for a Raja to go running to this Sahib and say, Are Sahib, this is my problem, help me, that guy is like this, and the guy would say, ah, very good, now I got another client here. Now we have, we, fly, we have to fly across the world to go to Washington to make that case. But why do we have to do that? Why, I mean, isn't it a, a matter of sovereignty that since we have courts, uh, with due process, since we have democracy, uh, since we have a uh, very open media, uh, that we ought to be able to, and Indians are bright, intelligent people, why aren't Indians able to sort this out among themselves? And these are very complex problems, and they won't all get solved immediately, but I don't think have, getting intervention has a track record of getting them solved either. Mm -hmm. I think this is basically a carrot for a few middlemen, intellectuals, a few activists, a few scholars, who make their careers on it. And, and therefore, these people are mobilized and trained and conditioned to uh, perpetrate a certain set of ideology in, in India, uh, which says that we are hopeless, we can't do it, we got to get someone else to do it. So I, I really think this has become kind of a career opportunity for some people with their own, own personal motives. I don't think that the Dalits the themselves are necessarily getting a whole lot of help. I mean, I've, I, I have talked to some people who are non-English speaking Dalit leaders. That's how I tell them. Yeah? who say that we don't even recognize all these guys who are flashing around the world half the time. We don't recognize them as our leaders. We have problems. We agree we have problems, but they are not going to solve our problems. So I think that's the other side of the story. Your second question, please. I was basically talking about poverty alleviation more than Dalits. But... Well, poverty alleviation also, how is, how is somebody sitting somewhere else going to... How? We can't say... Okay, if they are willing to take uh, 100 million people and give them citizenship and take them there, I mean, you could argue that maybe they should, we should have let them do that. I don't think they're offering anything like that. So I think, uh, how are they going to alleviate poverty here? I mean, I just don't understand what's the mechanism, what's the track record. I mean, it hasn't been done in Africa, it hasn't been done in Latin America with all these other kinds of programs. In, the only Indians, through their own enterprise, which is plentifully available, uh, can and will and are, in fact, uh, doing something about it. Yes. Yes, the lady at the back. My question is about this human rights policing by USA. I am glad that you're using the term Western when you are trying to define how human rights policing is being activated. I wonder why you have left out the UN and the way America has used the UN in its policing efforts. I would, I would like you to think about Africa and the breaking up of so many countries as on human rights, based on human rights interventions. I have this image of Bush the Elder walking into Somalia <coughs> using his army in an effort to provide famine relief, which was never given. Thank you. I think that's a fair comment, that the problem is uh, wider than just uh, what I've characterized. I just looked at one aspect of it. But this, uh, ten, uh, my overall feeling is that the Western powers, both uh, United States and EU as a unified entity, and China, and uh, are, are certainly becoming more nationalistic, more powerful, and working towards breaking up, disintegrating, fragmenting others. And that is my overarching theme and concern in the first lecture. Second one, I'll get into more specific case studies and examples. But I appreciate your comment. Let's take one more question. Yes, from the gentleman. My name is Ravi Chaudhary. I'm asking as a student. Uh, I wanted your views on uh, this famous uh, hegemony prism by Vinay, who said that hegemony is a factor of supremacy on military access, economic access, and cultural access. And we see the American decline, or rather, America is going sideways as far as the economy is concerned, but certainly a decline as far as the culture is concerned. Military might alone, will it be adequate to hold hegemony for long? So this is, a, this is an interesting point, and I have a, another long thesis on this. I don't think that uh, culture, when you say culture, economic, I agree, there's a long-term decline. It's not going to happen overnight. Military, I also agree, is enormously powerful, and there's no big competitor on the horizon in the foreseeable future. It's just just far too much. Uh, the the cultural, I think you should look at soft power as a as a paradigm, uh, not evaluate culture based on your and mine aesthetics 
or its morality or any of that. But evaluate culture based on its power to the influence. influence of soft power. Influence of soft power is enormous. The, the influence of American soft power is enormous. And America invests heavily to build soft power as an asset. Like you, as a, like you build infrastructure, physical infrastructure, industrial infrastructure, America invests heavily to build soft power as a form of infrastructure, as an, as an, as an asset for socio-economic value and political military value projection overseas. So I would say that the American soft power is pretty strong. Uh, last question, very last thing I have okay. I'm Shanta Sarajit Singh, I'm a journalist, and I'd like to add to your comment on uh, culture as soft power, because when PL480 was started, uh, the first point in that declaration, whereby food came to the underdeveloped part of the world, the first one was that American films will be screened everywhere that food was unloaded. Mm -hmm. But that's only uh, a comment arising out of that. My question is that the India studies industry began in the 50s and in the 60s when I was at Berkeley, I remember that I used to be very surprised by the inclusion of India in the generic term South Asian studies. How did that happen? Okay, uh, tomorrow is a full talk okay. on South <laughs> Asia, India, uh, you know, there was a there was a, a, a Title VI Act of the U.S. Congress. It's called Title VI Act of the U.S. Congress, which provided funds in the very early uh, uh, Cold War era uh, to construct and study a region known as South Asia. That's how the funding was given to construct this. So, if you are a college, and college is always looking for money. You have to apply in a certain form, show how you will study South Asia, what you will study, to impress upon the authorities that you will do it in the manner that they want you to do it, and there's a prescribed manner how they want you to do it. So obviously when you say money is available to do these things, there will be people coming. So these, uh, there are more than 30, 35 such places now that have South Asia studies programs and with the Title VI funding and so forth. So then there's other forces, other foundations, they come on board, then the thing gets a life of its own, then there's social groups and there's uh, identity cre identity engineering uh, is very rampant uh, when uh, kids leave when kids uh, indian kids are raised at home until they are in school they call themselves indian uh, when they go to college they start calling themselves south asian uh, because then they're, they're away from home uh, the influence of peers and professors and which you are part of this south asian dance group and south asian media group and south asian that group and so that is grilled into you and India as a nation is deconstructed, as, as devalued, as something to be almost ashamed of. And so either there is a South Asian identity, which is nice, or there is sub-nations underneath. And those activists are brought to show how India has actually harmed them. Uh, these these sub, what, I call, what are nowadays popularly called sub-nations in Harvard. Uh, these sub-nations are empowered, South Asia is empowered, the slice in between called India is is, uh, is uh, deconstructed. I have a lot of slides and a lot of uh, data on this uh, for tomorrow. Go ahead, Phoebe. They're all good things, even if they are provocative, have to come to an end. <laughs> <laughs> or at least a bridge. So maybe thank Rani, Nota, and wait until tomorrow. I have very one small comment to make on some of the questions or at least one. Have you thought of why philanthropy is of a certain type in India? Just think about it. Thank you.